Good morning, everyone. We'll just uh, we'll give it a few seconds um, to give people some time to join, and then we'll begin our webinar for today. All right, um, welcome everyone. We'll get started. Um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Fiona McDonald. I am Events and Communications Lead at the Invasive Species Council of British Columbia. My pronouns are she, her, and I am joining you today from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations, today known as Vancouver. Um, we are so excited to be joined by Corey Cliff, founder of Seven Generation Stewards Society, and I'm really looking forward to all the great knowledge that he's going to share with us today. Uh, before we begin, just a few technical things. I do have a colleague here, Jana, um, our communications coordinator, who will be in the back end and able to assist with any technical support. Uh, if you're having any difficulties, just please uh, pop it in the chat. Today's webinar is being recorded, um, and so it will be available to view at a later date, should you wish to send it to your colleagues or your friends. And I guess we'll get started. Oh, um, also, if you do have questions for Corey throughout his presentation, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we do um, encourage you to pop them in there. If there's a question that you wanted to ask that has already been asked, you can upvote it um, and it will rise to the top and we'll make sure that it's asked. Um, so we are joined today by Corey Cliff, who uh, was raised in Richmond, BC, but is now living in his home territory of Campbell River. He is, the mem he is a member of the Lake Talk peoples of Campbell River, um, and he is a father of three. Corey was actually supposed to join us at our annual forum earlier this year, um, but was unable to make it due to the birth of his son. So we were very excited for that reason um, of Corey not being able to join us. So we're happy to have him here today. He grew up and down, uh, grew up up and down the west coast of Canada and the US. Um, and at the age of 23, he began his journey in environmental work. First Nations archaeology connected Corey to his ancestors and gave him the passion to learn how he can make a difference. So while working part-time in archaeology, he was also working in the natural resource sector. Um, and I, he identified things that gave him cause for concern and drove him to found Seven Generation Stewards Society. Um, and so now Corey and his team are planning for future generations and how we can heal and preserve the biodiversity of this province for the generations to come. Um, and so with that, welcome, Corey. We are so happy to have you here. Hello, everybody. Um, very pleased to be here today. Um, so I am joining you from my traditional territory, the Alcatel people. Uh, we are, there are three nations existing today of the four. Um, that's the Wewakam, the Wewakai, Klika, and uh, once upon a time, the wallet, some people of uh, Salmon River were among us. Um, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge uh, somebody just chimed in from uh, Kitimat, the traditional territory of the Heisla people, I believe. Um, once upon a time, uh, our, our ancestral chief, uh, Chief Wakai in Topaz Harbor, um, <clears throat> he had a vision of the great flood coming and he told his people to carve canoes. So during that time, um, he organized his people and he, he sent a canoe to the far south and they landed in Nia Bay and they became the Macaw. And he sent four canoes to the four corners of the Liquidoke territory and those became the Wewakam, the Wewakai, the Kwika and the Walletsam. And he sent another canoe to the far north and they landed in Heisla or in Kitimat and they became the Heisla people. So we share a very, very similar dialect. And I've had the privilege of meeting a few people um, through different industries uh, that were Heisla. And this is how we came to actually research that little tidbit of information. So I'd just like to acknowledge Chris Wilson and the people of the Heisla territory for joining in today. Um, 
So I'm here to today to talk to you about uh, invasive species and their effects on our traditional medicines. My uh, speciality or the, the area that I, I focus on in traditional medicines is Devil's Club. Um, we, I utilize it for many things. During tribal journeys, we utilize the, the leftover stocks to create Devil's Club beads. Actually, I'm wearing some right now. They tend to make uh, great gifts. When you're in another person's territory, it's great to acknowledge the, their uh, generosity and letting you be in their territory. Um, but the cambium layer is the most important part of the plant to us. And that is uh, where all the, the healing comes from. So what I like to do is um, usually about the end of April, we're coming, I'm actually watching day to day right now uh, for the flowers to bloom on the Devil's Club. There's a, a beautiful bright red bloom at the top. <clears throat> and when that's present, the plant is at its, its prime. So because it is a regenerative plant, uh, but it takes a very long time, we tend to space out our, our harvesting techniques. And we tend to actually measure it out and do quite a bit of a stock count before we harvest so that we can consider um, what 30% looks like. So that's the maximum amount that we would harvest from any area. And it wouldn't be just a blob that we've taken out. This is, you know, we need to space it out so that the plant, we don't, we're not killing off plants. and um, you know, limiting our supply of the, the healing factor. So once we cut it down, um, it's covered in a very protective layer. Uh, forestry engineers and civiculture workers alike avoid it like the plague. Um, best described as thorns that resemble hypodermic needles. Uh, when it gets into your, into your skin and all it takes is a brush, um, you have to wait for it to kind of fester and pop to get the spine out, so it's very uncomfortable, very itchy. Um, but once you scrape that outside layer off and during this time, um, it will come off very easily. You're left with a, a beautiful bright green cambium layer. And I, I describe it very much like the feeling of a banana peel. Um, so we'll slip the, the whole stock from top to bottom and peel it off and we hang dry it. Uh, once it's dried up, I like to crumble it and I'll take a big mason jar, usually uh, I believe they're 1.3 liters and I pack it full as, as tight as I can. And we order uh, first press olive oil from uh, straight from Italy. So it's, it's very pure. Uh, we'll top off the jar with that and we seal it up and we let that sit for about three or yeah, about a year. Um, I tend to date them. Sometimes I get impatient, so it'll come out, you know, a week or two early. Uh, but this makes a beautiful salve. Um, so once it's come out of its, uh, its soaking period, we tend to boil it. And once the, uh, all the particles in, in the oil actually start to turn black, we sift it out and we start to add in things like uh, beeswax. Uh, some people in my community use other things like shea butter, um, more modernized things that you can buy at the store, a little bit more readily available. I like to use locally sourced uh, beeswax myself. Uh, it has a beautiful smell to it. Uh, and a lot of times I will infuse this medicine with, for example, uh, balsam pitch, alder pitch, um, maybe for smell, a little bit of lavender. Uh, my, my partner and I, we grow, uh, we have, I believe eight lavender plants that I picked from yearly. So um, yeah, it gives it a beautiful smell and everything coming together. You end up with a beautiful colored salve, just like this. I'm not sure if you can see very well. And it's a very, very distinguished smell. When, when you walk into the room and you, it's present, you, you know it's there, it's a beautiful smell. Um, so there, there's, there's many healing properties of the cambium layer once the salve is created. Um, it's great for eczema, rashes, uh, 
even for pregnant women, you know, as the belly starts to rise a little bit, uh, keep rubbing it on there and, and you'll find after pregnancy, there's no stretch marks. Um, even as far as scars, you know, it helps get rid of uh, scar tissue on the outside. So you know, some people aren't left with, uh, for example, a big ugly scar on, on the face that might make them very self-conscious or, um, yeah, many different properties. Anyways, so um, that's the area that I've been focusing on. I have been blessed to work with many different people. Uh, my background, beginning in archaeology, I was introduced to two family members that I hadn't previously met, uh, Louis Wilson of Cape Mudge and Christine Roberts of uh, Campbell River, uh, both members of the League Without People. Uh, so it just so happened that two of my cousins were archaeologists and I got an opportunity to go and work with them. So over the years, uh, doing archaeological reconnaissance uh, for my nation, I got to learn quite a bit from uh, Christine as far as, you know, a responsibility to our people and tomorrow's generation. Uh, Louis Wilson and the Wilson clan of Cape Mudge, they, they brought a lot to the table as far as traditional medicines and things like that. So uh, I got an opportunity to learn from Louis day to day as we were working in the bush about different plants and, and Devil's Club just happened to be my favorite. Uh, but there's another valuable that one that we tend to, uh, it, it's becoming harder and harder to find um, due to logging practices and whatnot. Uh, Red Rishi is, it's become a very valuable resource on the coast here. Uh, many different people all over the world use it. It's great for internal infections. And uh, yeah, so Red Rishi is most easily found on the north side of a dying cedar. Uh, it is a conch. Uh, a lot of people describe it as a conch. It's a it, it looks like a regular conch with a bright red lip, and then you'll start to see um, a little bit of red rise through the top of it. You definitely want to cut this up before you dry it, because once it dries, it becomes hard as a rock. You you might as well actually you will need a bandsaw to cut it if you if you don't cut it beforehand. Uh, I have a partner who works with me in Seven Generation Steward Society named Marvin Puglis, who could better speak to Red Rishi. Um, he's currently teaching me a little bit about that. And as soon as we actually get back out into the field this year, I'm, I'm excited to actually uh, harvest a little bit more red reishi for my community because it's one of those things that's becoming harder and harder to find. And um, I, have, I have seen the effects of red reishi battling off uh, people who are actually hospitalized. So it's or bringing them out of the hospital, I should say, not, <laughs> not battling them. So, um, yeah, there, there's many different medicines within our territory that we tend to utilize. Uh, I have an auntie who tends to harvest a lot of stinging nettle, um, chocolate lilies. I have, I'll be honest, I have zero experience using chocolate lily, but uh, it, it is on the list of items for me to explore in my near future. Um, but the threats to these or these traditional medicines are all over the place. You know, they, they range from, um, you know, gre um, greenhouse gases to, uh, you know, logging practices to invasive species. And there's, there's so many things that are affecting our ability to harvest these medicines right now. So my, my objective is to utilize our society to uh, help create better practices that will preserve our ability to harvest in the, for the next generation and the generation to follow. Uh, I'm a firm believer in you know, my grandchildren and my grandchildren's grandchildren need to be able to enjoy the same sockeye, um, you know, the, the same traditional medicines, uh, the same elk and deer that we have been for many years. So, you know, we need to put together a plan for this. It's a beautiful time. And I think the time is right to start putting something substantial together in, in this area because, you know, First Nations, we are getting 
<clears throat> we're getting a lot of responsibility back from the colonial government that took the responsibility away from us. There's a term that we operate under, uh, it's stewardship. Stewardship means maintaining the balance on land, sea, and within our community. Uh, we didn't have a traditional word back then to describe this responsibility. So uh, if we do, I haven't found it yet. So uh, I'm still on that journey and it may actually exist within our dialect. So don't quote me on that. Um, but when we think about a term like stewardship, that means that we have this uh, multi-generational responsibility and I consider our generation the fourth, fourth generation. We are fixing the mistakes of the generation that came before us and preparing the next generation for the good work that needs to take place. So this is the time for us to create some policies, some, some good planning with forestry licensees and whatnot to better protect um, you know, things that we find further up into, for example, um, timber harvest areas. As we move further down into, uh, you know, estuaries and things like that, the, the threats change and they become more um, of the invasive species. For example, uh, scotch broom, uh, knotweed. We're seeing a little bit of hogweed coming up into the Campbell River area now. And you know this concerns me a little bit, well, not a little bit, but it concerns me quite a bit simply because um, right in our estuary, there is a small, pla small patch of black mean. I believe it, the non-indigenous term is cow parsnip, um, but our singers, we would chew that during our potlatches so that we could sing for longer. You know, sometimes our ceremonies go for two, three, four days, it all depends how many people come, how big the celebration is, how significant it is. You know, sometimes it warrants a, a four day celebration. So the singers, we need to be able to sing that entire time. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it's a very small patch within our territory and within arm's reach of it right now, we're starting to see um, Scotch broom popping up all over our estuary actually that's the, the main threat in our estuary right now. There's probably four hectares of land right next to the estuary that's just riddled with scotch broom that's you know sending more seeds downstream right into salmon rearing habitat. And it's, it's taking over um, some very, very important habitat. So we're, we tend to have a lot of um, rearing habitat that's disappearing. So it's created room for uh, environmental restoration projects that are kind of multi-pronged approaches. For example, uh, in our estuary, we have invasive species removal in partnership between uh, Waywacom First Nation Coastal Guardian Watchmen who are doing a fantastic job, Greenways Land Trust, who just last year had a full team operating in the Campbell River water, or, yeah, in the Campbell River watershed for a full year. Um, we also have uh, groups that work directly in the streams like the stream keepers and uh, you know, Department of Fisheries and BC Hydro provide us a pretty good amount of support. There's always room for more. Uh, <clears throat> but that being said, you know, and, until we, get an opportunity to have a, a larger effort in this estuary, um, so many different resources are gonna be threatened. Uh, you know, natural or, um, invasive species aren't the only threat. You know, they're along the inside coast of the island every year, there's, uh, there's a goose harvest um, in partnership with different First Nations and that, it, that provides an opportunity to rein in some of the numbers of the geese. Uh, I've taken part in this three years in a row and still believe that it's it's a fantastic program done very humanely, but uh, the idea behind that is, of course, to protect the salmon habitat, which um, is created by sedges or uh, carex grass in the intertidal zone, and that creates kind of the, the stream banks and whatnot in the uh, saltwater, freshwater uh, 
I guess, transitional zones where uh, salmon fry tend to hang out and hide. So it creates a lot of rearing habitat for them. So, um, you know, we could, we could, I could move into different threats towards our estuary, you know, all day long. And I tend to get sidetracked because I think about this a lot. But uh, getting back to the invasive species, you know, there, as we move further into the tidal flats, um, we have different in, different species of um, plants coming in that are actually starting to push out the important non-traditional medicines. But for example, the carrot grass, and when that happens, we use, we lose our plains for uh, chocolate lily, uh, stinging nettle, and a few other um, lesser known medicines that grow in the area. So as we tend to lose these, it, it has, growing up, I never realized how much of an effect it would have on our nation. And unfortunately, you know, we're, we're in a time right now where we're trying to cor correct the mistake of the previous generation's wild, wild west of harvesting. So, you know, overfishing, overlogging, um, you know, mismanaging different types of natural resources and, and we're, we're paying the price for that right now. So the opportunity for my nation and, and many nations all over Canada to have a say in what's happening within our territory, um, you know, that gives us an opportunity to protect these things that even during the potlatch ban, some of our elders were able to harvest and um, handle the things that weren't readily available for them. So, sorry, I, 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 I was, I was going to touch into, you know what, I, I'm getting, previous to colonialization, we relied on our traditional medicines 100%. And after that time, we weren't even allowed to teach these things to our children. So as the years went on, this, this knowledge was lost or hidden and it had to be hidden. And that, you know, that, uh, that touches me in, in, a, in a really deep spot because I, I'm one of those people who doesn't know who he is. Uh, I'm, I'm currently learning my language and I feel like I connect through culture, through tribal journeys and through the archeological work that I do. So as we get an opportunity to utilize these traditional medicines and this knowledge has a resurgence, I, th I think it's important that we get an opportunity to work with licensees to consider the fact that, you know, in, in most logging blocks on the coast here, there's a stream running through it, that at some point along that stream, there's gonna be Devil's Club. And it's a, it's a very sensitive plant. So when all that sedimentation and you know oils, gas and everything goes down into the stream and works its way down, you know, that's, that's the biggest threat right now to a Devil's Club stand in our, in our territory is, uh, is logging, you know, it doesn't need to be within the block. So when this happens, I, I honestly, I don't have an answer to how we can address this, but it, I don't believe it stops at, you know, the devil's club. I believe as it moves further and further down the stream system, it starts to affect different types of, of medicines that grow along the streams and then makes it to our estuary where you know, the abundance of, and, and, you know, most of our, our tr traditional village sites are and, and archeological sites. And this is how I've actually come to identify where most of these medicines grow is through archeology. span So um, I don't have an answer for, you know, what the next step is towards creating protective policy around traditional medicines. But I do know that as we move further and further towards um, having full control over our territories and, and having the infrastructure built to maintain it, we need to have a certain relationship with all these different organizations to recognize the fact that not 
everything comes from a pill. And we need these things. We need these traditional medicines. Um, you know, Greenways, uh, I, I forever hold my hands up in gratitude to Greenways Land Trust and the team there because uh, Cynthia Ben Dixon, who's been there ever since my first experience with Greenways, um, has taken a special interest in invasive species and protecting our estuary. So I'm, I'm forever grateful to their team for the great work that they've done. Um, <clears throat> You know, we need to see more groups like this or more support to groups like this to help fight off the this spreading threat. You know, it's it's all over Campbell River. I know in the Comox Valley, just south of us, they have quite a bit of hogweed and it's becoming a major threat to even cyclists going down the side of the road. And, you know, the effects of, of these plants, not just on traditional medicines, but on our bodies. Um, can have you know lifelong effects. For example, the the hogweed. Um, I don't have much experience with hogweed. My my main focus in our estuary has been the removal of um, Scotch broom. So we've tried everything from um, cutting and using natural naturally based sprays to um, industrially made broom pullers. Uh, strategic forest management back in 2012, I believe it was, donated three to us. And they got some good use, but when you consider, you know, the size of the areas that we're looking at that are just, you know, wall to wall uh, scotch broom, it, it's a losing battle. So, uh, yeah, the, the more support we can get towards, um, for example, the Campbell River Estuary. Um, there's another estuary just south of us in Comox that has the same problem. <clears throat> the better, because these are our life centers. These are the places where um, everything upstream is affected by everything downstream and vice versa. So. You know the salmon that need to go upstream they're they're going to be hanging out in these estuaries and if there's nowhere to hang out for them then our fishing industry is going to go down and it's it's such a sensitive place that i'm surprised that we don't see more support towards estuarine restoration programs on the coast here um, there's some great groups that specialize in it for example the mid-island guardians of the estuary i believe they operate out of uh, Qualicum Bay, um, but they have a network of, of organizations that specialize in, in estuary restoration and wildlife management and things like that. They can always use more support and the, the more we support groups like this through different initiatives, the more we get an opportunity to identify ways to better protect traditional medicines. Um, I've recently applied for a couple of grants to try and get a program off the ground that will actually help us, um, will we'll actually provide some funding to sit down and put pen to paper on some ideas behind uh, traditional medicine protection within our territory. Uh, I've seen some great examples from different territories. I've, I've even met a professor uh, from Victoria who was from India gave me a warning that kind of sparked this whole, you know, what are we going to do to protect what we have uh, right now? And uh, the more we talk about this, the, the more I talk about it with different people, the, the more that fire gets stoked. And um, I'm excited for, you know, the field season for 2022. I'm excited for the field season for 2023, because I think that locally and hopefully island-wide, we get an opportunity to better, am I coming up on time? No, okay. Um, we get an opportunity to better understand how we can come up with a permanent solution to uh, a problem that we've, we're becoming more comfortable with. That being said, I've actually gotten to the end of my notes. So if, uh, if anybody has any questions, I see there's five or six here in chat. 
Great. Um, yes, that's why I jumped in. I felt as if we could uh, perhaps start a little bit of a discussion, Corey, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Um, we are so, so grateful for you joining us today. And um, I think it's very clear in the way that you speak about this issue, these issues, like just how, how close it is to you and how uh, much it impacts you and your nation. You spoke a lot about stewardship and while there may or may not be a traditional word in your language for it, it's obviously been practiced by your nation and nations across this land for since time immemorial. But over the last very short few centuries, um, so much destruction has been undone. And now that you're you're not just facing the challenge of stewardship, you're facing the challenge of repairing what has been done while continuing to practice stewardship. Um, and on top of that, the generational trauma that, that you spoke about. So, so I wonder, you know, what drives you? What is giving you optimism and hope to do the work that you're doing and, and to outreach the way that you're outreaching? Um, the biggest thing that drives me right now is my kids. I have a parent's responsibility. What, what is my daughter going to be eating when she's in her 30s? Is she going to be eating the same traditional foods? Is she going to be able to harvest the things that she's grown up harvesting with me, making the same medicines and whatnot? You know, these are the things that um, my biggest concerns, but also the reason that I wake up and look forward to work every day is because everything that we get to do from here out is a step in the right direction. And that's, it's obviously clear even in the, what you've named your organization, right? Seven Generations. Um, could you, could you speak more about the, the work that Seven Generation Stewards is doing and, and what plans you have for the field seasons coming up? Absolutely. Um, well, our, to be honest, our organization was actually founded out of the need for uh, a multi-nation canoe family. My community is a hub community, meaning that we have people from all over the North Island in smaller rural communities who move here to you know, come and work and access um, education and just you know, socialization and whatnot. So uh, we tend to have a lot of people from the North Island coming here. Um, tribal journeys, I, I personally believe is one of the best medicines that people can get on the coast. And unfortunately, because of COVID, it hasn't happened for the last couple of years. Um, <clears throat> but that, you know, that was the, the original idea for uh, us starting a nonprofit organization. And well, to be honest, I didn't know what I was building when, you know, I, I kind of went through with all the paperwork and everything because um, Myself and everybody that I work with right now, we have always been people who had ideas, but we're kind of stuck without a voice. And uh, so fast forward a couple of months, uh, I was talking with a friend of mine that worked for BC Hydro and I was trying to do some fundraising for our canoe family that we're starting Seven Generation Stewards Society. Um, and he said, so, so hold on a second. You've gone and started a nonprofit organization that is First Nations led and you're doing this just for funding a canoe family. I said, yeah, he said, and I've been listening to you for about five years talk about your frustrations and not being able to get you know, this project off the ground or this project off the ground. He said, how about you just take 10 steps back sit down and think about it for a week and don't bug me until you've got um, you know a purpose and to be honest uh, you know we didn't foresee this potential this level of, of involvement uh, in the very beginning but you know we sat down and, and my cousin it's our board of directors is all people that in some way, shape, or form um, related to or connected to, we're all from the Lupidok canoe family. Um, so we sat down and we thought about, you know, what can we what can we do here? And, you know, we've got three archaeologists within Seven Gen, um, two are on the board of directors. We've got one who 
just finished Coastal Guardian Watchman training, one who works with the Ministry of Children and Families, and one who is a cultural leader from the North Island. So the potential was, was enormous. And we decided to just start identifying the voids in our community and, and where our community needed the most support, um, working in partnership with, actually when I was working for We Will Come Coastal Guardian Watchman, um, I got an opportunity to work with Greenways and learn what they were about. So um, I realized that organizations like Greenways and, and We Will Come Coastal Guardian Watchmen need the support to you know, get these projects all the way to completion. I'm sure they could do it on their own, but a team effort, you know, many hands make light work. So um, we started taking on little bits of the estuary restoration project that's shared in a community partnership. Um, as well as, you know, what we had to explore the, the term stewardship, what does it mean? And to us, that means maintaining the balance on land, sea, and within our community. Um, a lot of people laugh when I say this, but 300 years ago, when people would just show up in our community and set up shop uninvited, we would do one of two things. We would either lop their head off, stick it on a spike and make an example of them, or we would welcome them and educate them and accept them and respect them. We don't do those things anymore. I understand why we don't do one, but you know, there's, there's a lot going on within my, my own community. And I don't think that First Nations themselves are equipped to manage an entire community of non-Indigenous people. You know, we're looking at a community of, I believe we're at 140,000. With, That's incredible. With uh, three, three reservations in town, uh, one across the water on Cape Mudge, and um, I believe four displaced First Nations, like they're just offices that are in Campbell River that represent their nation's territory. Um, you know, so there's probably about 10,000, you know, First Nations, maybe 15,000 here in Campbell River uh, as, this is just my own personal estimation, but you know, when we consider what the term stewardship means, you know, that means that we need to have an effect on the broader community, not just on our, our people, but you know, doing things for the non-Indigenous people here as well, because their actions affect our community. So we do a lot of work with the homeless. Um, we work in the downtown core. Last year we provided 26,300 and something dollars in uh, funding that began at the beginning of the heat wave. So we would just, we started going downtown, integrating, um, you know, with the homeless people and talking with them. Um, sometimes just sitting down with, you know, six pizzas and, and calling over a crowd and, and just connecting with people, talking with people. These are real people. And, uh, I was surprised at how many people are there who are maintaining sobriety and they're just caught in the system. So these people are our responsibility. We, we work with some great organizations like Liquido Family Life, um, the Homeless Coalition, AVI, OPS, uh, a number of different homeless shelters in town. And we, we try not to just maintain the status quo, but, but create a better tomorrow for people, uh, whether they're suffering from addictions, um, mental health, or, you know, they're just stuck in the system. You know, we, we want to do something to help. So this year, uh, our field season, I'm not exactly sure what it's going to look like yet. Uh, I'm currently waiting to get a hold of some funding that will help get a six person crew uh, with three part time student volunteers. Um, operating in invasive, in invasive species removal in our territory. Um, but as far as the programming that we have available this year, we're focusing more on uh, employment and training and follow your passion. It's, it's no longer about getting a job for today or tomorrow. It's about figuring out what your career path 
what are you passionate about? Let's help you follow that and let's create the 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 plan behind that. Sure. Um, and so um and so I'm wondering like if you if you had to prioritize a resource that you needed and you're asked, would it would it be funding? Would it be um hands-on support? Um I don't the science side of things, uh, uh, policy, legislation, what would your number one call to action be to support the work that you're doing? Hmm. That is a great question. I think I think the 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 best call to action that could take place would be um, I can't remember what the, if, if, is it the Ministry of Natural Resources or Forest Lands and Ranges? I was just calling the Ministry of Forestry. Um, Glenrose. You know, if at the government level they started reaching out to First Nations and organizing meetings between uh, licensees, um, biologists, and, you know, cultural leaders, as well as government officials to figure out, you know, what is the criteria for these protection orders going to look like? You know, what kind of data do we need? Excuse me. Um, what kind of data do we need to collect to ensure that 30 years from now, these same Devil's Club plots are still going to be where they are? Um, like I said, it's a very sensitive plant. It, if it dies out, it's I've tried transplanting it myself and never been successful. Uh, I've only ever seen it done once. Um, that's at the Campbell River Museum. Don't ask me how they did it, but uh, yeah, the staff who, by the way, was all non-Indigenous uh, managed to transplant it. And I was <laughs> thoroughly impressed. <laughs> I gotta say, I was thoroughly impressed. They've got a great little uh, garden out outside where they've set up a number of different traditional medicines that they manage yeah. to transplant. Um, but you know, when if we don't respect these sites, then they disappear. And yeah. who knows if it's gonna pop up again further downstream or if there is another existing plot or what this could look like. Um, and I think that's a really great point. And, and to stewardship, you know, saying stewardship is harmony between the land and the sea and, all of our resources, but you're also doing stewardship with the community and with people. Um, and so I guess um, what I'm wondering is how can, how can we, the general public, work to further that collaboration and help you in your stewardship? And, and we have a question in the question and answer box here as well. Um, like what can local settlers, landowners, municipal park staff, invasive plants removal volunteers, how can we restore, protect, and allow access um, what can your everyday person do to help you in this journey? Um, and help ourselves, I should say, it's not just you. <laughs> All that's, of a, that's a great question. Um, well, I believe ISCBC has an app where you can report in on invasive species that you see you can even take i haven't personally used it yet because i just got a new phone um, yes i know i know <laughs> um, but from what i hear it's a fantastic app um, that would have to be step one is if you see it report it um, you know, and, and of course, you know, organizations like Greenways or local First Nations that have environmental teams or, um, you know, different nonprofits operating in that sector, you know, they, they operate the same way that my organization does, and that's off of grants, you know, we have to apply for our money. So any support that our community can provide is always welcome that, you know, that every day is, another goal achieved. So, you know, every dollar helps get that day funded, uh, tools into people's hands. Um, 
I, I know I keep bringing up Greenways, but if you check out their website, if you're in the Campbell River area, Greenways Land Trust has a website where you can sign up for volunteer work. I highly suggest it because um, in our area, these the most of the people who come and volunteer are um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous stewards of our territory, people who are highly educated and specialize in different natural resource sectors. Um, in our area, actually, I, I've identified people from um, BCTS, uh, you know, BC Parks, and these are all people who do it for a living and then come out and volunteer on Saturday and Sunday. So it's a beautiful thing to see, you know, great opportunity to bring the kids out and teach them, you know, these are the plants that we don't want to see. These are the plants that we want to help grow. Uh, <clears throat> and even as far as, as, you know, forestry practices, you know, for, for the people out there who work with forestry companies, um, it doesn't stop at the timber block. You know, all along the roads, we've, we've got to get brushers in there. We've got to get, um, to be honest, we need to get prescriptions done on how to remove uh, invasive species in a commercial setting, uh, you know, along the logging roads and access roads, things like that. Um, because these can be, these are places where they're getting packed into the dirt, that's getting packed into the tires, that's going down to the sort getting loaded onto ships and then going to different parts of the province or these ships are showing up empty, you know, the barges. And we're now introducing invasive species into more rural areas of, of my traditional territory. Uh, you know, when, when, when I'm a helicopter ride and a 45 minute truck ride followed by an hour and a half quad ride and then a half hour walk away from civilization and I see scotch broom there, something ain't right. <laughs> so we've right. got to do that. We can do better. Um, and I, I think it's, um, it's, it's a challenge is getting people to understand um, the holistic view of it, right? It's, it's very easy to describe to someone, here is an invasive species, now please pull it out. But what they're not seeing are the many, many layers of how that species got there. Um, the impacts it has after. And, and I'm even thinking like your example about goose populations affecting um, salmon fry and salmon habitat. Um, it's these connections. Um, I, there's the site here um, that the Tsleil-Waututh Nation are working to reclaim and they have planted a medicinal garden, but they're not currently able to use the plants because of the um, leftover chemicals in the soil from the industry that used to be there. And so um, it's the same in invasive species management, trying to get people to understand the pathways and the, um, the consequences. Um, so, so what are your thoughts on, on how we can get people to understand that everything and everybody is connected? That's um, a big question, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I gotta say, I've got a lot of respect for the fact that um, they've gone and planted the garden there just because of the fact that uh, people need to see that we're there. You know, it's, I've heard a lot of, of not criticism, but questions about like, well, like, do you guys use your whole territory? I've personally walked my whole territory through archaeological reconnaissance, forestry, engineering, and civiculture work. I have walked almost every part of our territory, or at least driven past it. Uh, and, you know, it's, sorry, I started getting sidetracked there. Um, uh, what was your question again? How, um, how we can get people to understand that it's not just the, the plant that you can see with your eyes and then take tactical uh, measures against it. How can we um, get people to understand that everything is connected from the soil to the plant, to how it got there in the first place, to how it's affecting the medicinal plants it's a it's a whole it's a, a holistic approach okay um well i personally i think signage is the best way you know we've got to invest a lot more into signage and um, I, i'm a big fan of using signage that is unappealing to graffiti um 
there's a guy that works for Greenways named Chuck DeSorcy, who's actually picked out some colors for some of the signage in Campbell River that still remains untagged when like 10 feet away, there's a whole kiosk that's just covered. Um, so, you know, pick, it, pick your colors for signage so that people are still gonna get an opportunity to read it. Um, make a spectacle of it. You know, uh, there's there's a lot of people who will just walk right past it. So if you, if you set it up, you know, um, I'm not saying put some carvings and, and artwork into it, but, you know, put something that's gonna draw people to it so that they, you know, the people who are, don't know anything about it and are just there to enjoy scenery on their Sunday are gonna understand, you know, the effects of, for example, letting their dog run around in a, a small fenced off area that just happens to be deltoid balsam root. Um, you know, the, that dog running around in there can can easily knock out a whole transplantation that's taking place, which actually happened on the Tai Spits uh, at one of our locations last year. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, it's, there's, everybody has a right to be out there and enjoy it, but everybody has a responsibility to get the education, to understand what it is that they're enjoying so that they can better respect it. Um, I think the, the best Way to do it is signage and you know taking a step further get us into the schools start getting kids out into nature you know as part of the curriculum to say you know these are um the invasive plants in that are, are threatening your immediate neighborhood or your territory or this that or the above and get them involved put a tool in their hand give them a feeling of accomplishment make them feel like the leaders of tomorrow because if they don't feel like the leaders of tomorrow they're not going to be the leaders of tomorrow and then we're left without anybody to carry on our work totally and we know we know children are such a uh, great pathway for information to adults right so i'm thinking of um reduce reuse recycle was a great example of how if you can get kids passionate about it in the schools they'll come home to um, their parents and the rest of the family and say, look how awesome this is. Um, we're my just, school, we're coming. My oh. school actually had a dance to that. I'm not going to do it, but they actually had a dance to it. I feel as if you can't tell us that and then not do the dance. Perhaps you next time. Enough to do it. <laughs> uh, we are coming up to time, but there's a, a question in the chat box that is very good. And I can't believe I didn't ask Corey, what is your hat made of? Hmm. Uh, my uncle Tom Wilson of Cape Mudge uh, made this for me. It's red cedar. It's gorgeous. So he does um, many different styles. The biggest one that I've seen him do is a sombrero uh, for a gentleman from Nisqually. It was probably three and a half feet round. That's incredible. How much, do you know how much time? Could you estimate how much time it would take to make? That probably took him a couple of days. Um, he also does sell them online. Um, so they're in the process of getting a website up right now, but um, his wife handles all the ordering and purchasing, uh, Patty Ann Wilson. And she's um, actually, they're the ones who taught me the most about how to make myself. So. Uh, Excellent. Yeah, um, he's a wealth of knowledge and he's probably the best weaver that I've, I've met in our territory. It's just incredible. I, as someone with very little hands-on skills and talent, I'm just in awe anytime I, I see artisans and, and crafts and um, I beautiful tried pieces of art. I, I tried my hand at it and it, it takes a special type of patience. Oh, yeah. And really they're, they're works of art, right? The time yeah. and the love that go into them. Um, so with that, I am I'm going to thank you for joining us, Corey. Um, a reminder to those who attended that this webinar was recorded um, and so you can watch it again or send it to your friends and colleagues. We will post it online. Corey, I don't think this is the last that we've seen of you at ISC. We're um, very interested in the work you're doing because um, it's good and it's important work and so we're happy to, uh, to know you and to be working alongside you and we can't wait to see what this field season brings for your organization. Awesome. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here.
Thank you. And Corey. everybody, if you don't have that app, download it. Remember, if you see it, report it. Yes. So that app is um, you can either use Seek by iNaturalist or the iNaturalist app um, to make um, observe and report invasive species. There's also the BC Invasives app where um, where you can make observations there. Uh, thank you so much, Corey. No problem. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. Hello, Tesla.